we can all be impatient at times, but I think the biggest thing that contributes to calmness is meditation and just do it. You don't have to say to yourself, oh, I want to be calm. I want to be calm. I'm trying to be calm. I need to be calm because that just doesn't really work. If you just simply meditate and make that a practice in your life, the calmness will just come. And the same thing with immersing yourself in nature, then the calmness will come from the nature. Hey, my friends, this is Nishant and do welcome to the Nishant Gurk Show. This is a podcast about helping you live a fulfilled life. The mission of the show is to spread mindfulness awareness and my job on this show is to invite world-class experts to extract the practices, routines and habits to help you live a fulfilled and abundant life. Today's guest is Bruce Langford. Bruce has been an entrepreneur and musician all his adult life. He quit his day job in 2005 to become focused full-time on the prevention of bullying. Working as a presenter and program creator in the bullying field led Bruce to become a mindfulness coach and teacher. Bruce also hosts the Mindfulness Mode podcast where he shares the concept of mindfulness with the mainstream world. Bruce is a mindfulness consultant who is hired by companies to improve employee work-life balance by replacing stress and anxiety with team spirit and self-respect. His extensive background in bullying prevention equips him through mindfulness to inspire employees to replace self-bullying and judgmental behaviors with a strong desire for cooperation and respect. In this episode, Bruce talks about building confidence, his music career, how he became less judgmental through meditation, anti-bullying, forming positive habits, cultivating calm and gratitude, and much, much more. Please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Bruce. Bruce, welcome to the show. Nishant, great to be here. I'm so excited. You have such an awesome podcast yourself, and I love how you share the message of mindfulness with the world. Great to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. You made my morning. Well, we are recording this podcast early in the morning, so I would love to ask you, did you have your breakfast or what did you have in the breakfast? No, I didn't have breakfast. I'm, I do intermittent fasting, so I haven't had any food yet and I won't have any food for a while yet. So no, I didn't have anything. Just water, lots of water. <laughs> intermittent fasting, how many hours of intermittent fasting do you do? Well, at this point in time, I, I just eat one meal a day. So I, I, you know, usually eat around five, between five and 6 p.m. And then after 7.30 p.m., I don't have any food until the next day. It requires a lot of discipline and patience. Yes, it does. And as I have improved with my discipline. I just feel better in a lot of areas of my life. I, I started this exercise back in January. It was part of a New Year's resolution and it's really made a huge difference to me in my life. So I've lost I've lost about 30 pounds. So I was just a little bit overweight and uh, I feel better. I'm more energetic and I feel really great about the fact that I made a promise to myself and I stuck with it. I made a promise and I kept it. And I think that's the most important part of it all. Usually promises are made to be broken. <laughs> what, <laughs> what made you to keep up with your promise? What made me keep it? I just, I just believe in, I believe in commitment. And I, and I know that we don't always keep our commitments, but I just wanted to exercise this challenge to keep my commitment in certain areas. And one was I read every day for a certain period of time. And one was uh, about what I eat or don't eat. And, you know, so I have different, different commitments to myself and they have really helped me. They really helped me feel more dedicated to my own mission. We'll come back to dedication, commitment and discipline because they are all tied up to the mindfulness kind of practices. So we'll come back to that for sure. 
And uh, while I was doing homework on your profile, I found that you have been a musician throughout your life. Could you walk us through about that experience? When I was a little child, my my aunt would come to visit and she was a big happy woman who smiled a lot laughed a lot and she would always sit down to the piano and it was like magic she would just move her hands across the keys in big broad strokes she would play from the very left hand side to the right hand side play so many keys and it was just all such happy music and as a little boy I was like oh I want to be able to do that that's so incredible and so that was one of my goals in life from the time I was a little child and I asked my parents could I please take piano lessons could I please learn and it took two years of asking that question until finally they said okay as long as you agree to pay for your own lessons. And so skip ahead, I loved playing music so much. And then later I had a chance to go to university and study music. And then I became a music teacher and had my own students that I absolutely loved and just enjoyed teaching music so much in schools. So that's just a little bit of a just a little story about how music has played a role in my life. At what age did you start playing music? When I was nine. And how did you influence your parents <laughs> for two years? I just, I just kept asking and I knew that less is more. Even back then, I knew that I couldn't you know, I just could only ask once in a while and not be irritating and not be pushy. I just would mention it. Hey, you know, I'd love to take piano lessons. And there would always be a two word answer. And that those two words were, we'll see. We'll <laughs> see. And then that was it. And it never seemed like there was going to be any answer. But the fact is, my father loved music and he loved he loved the music of the church and we would go to church and i admired some of the musicians there that played the piano and i loved watching them and listening to them especially the ones that were very confident and could just sit down and really make that piano sing you know and so I had different people that I wanted to emulate, and I, I just got very excited. And then my dad finally said, okay, because he, he absolutely loved music, but he, I didn't really know that he did at first because he was a farmer and he was always out in the fields and on the tractor. And I didn't really realize at that young age how much he loved music, but later I did. There is a great lesson in this story that keep keep asking persistence and not being pushy and yes. if we don't ask we won't get it so just keep asking ask and you shall be given yes i think you're right yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> and uh, coming back to your day job in 2005 you did quit your day job in 2005 could you tell us what kind of job were you working at that time yeah, I used to teach in a school and I, I taught music full time and absolutely loved teaching music. But I, I kept thinking in the back of the, my mind that maybe there was a way I could help more people. And one day I was out look, supervising the, the children on the yard and I saw this one boy and he was over leaning against the wall, looking very sad and left out. And he was a boy that I knew because he was a member of my AV club and he was in my band. And, and I went over and I talked to him and I said, why are you over here when all the, other, all the other kids are over there playing basketball and having a good time? And he said, oh, it's nothing. It's okay. It's, it's nothing. And he wouldn't really tell me. So I talked to some of the other kids and they said, oh, Oh, he gets picked on all the time. He's, he's bullied all the time. And so he, nobody wants him over here playing. And so I talked more and I said, what's going on? Why is he being picked on? They said, oh, it's his accent. And I said, what accent? I didn't think he even had an accent. And 
there were very few children at this school from other places. And he was, he was just like everybody else. He was from our area in Canada. He was, he was not a person that grew up anywhere else. And I didn't think he had an accent at all. But when I truly listened, I heard that he had a very small speech impediment, just certain words he couldn't say properly. And so I talked to him and I, I said, you know, how could I help you? And I, I, ended up deciding to start a musical anti-bullying program that I could take into other schools because I knew that way I could help a lot more children if I reached out, went to all kinds of other schools, and I wanted him to help me. I said, would you be in a video and would you talk to the kids in a video and tell them what it feels like to actually be bullied? And at first he said, oh, I could never do that. And then one day he came and he knocked on my classroom door and he said, Mr. Langford, if I could help even one kid who is bullied, it would be worth it. I'll make that video. And we spent an hour videotaping this boy talking about, you know, all the feelings he had about being bullied and what his experience was like. And we edited it down into a three minute video that has now been seen by over a hundred thousand middle school children. What did you teach to that kid before you started your anti bullying program? I taught him confidence. I taught him that he was worth it, that he was enough, that it didn't matter whether other people made fun of him, other people put him down, whether other people ridiculed him for the way he talked. I taught him that he was worth it and he had value. And I could do that through music. And I encouraged him with the music he played. I encouraged him in my club that he was in, looking after the microphones and the speakers and everything. And so he gradually built up his confidence and became, later in life, he became a pilot. And he was very successful. So through music, you were able to instill confidence in him and in other kids. Is there any other practice you would suggest to build confidence, self-esteem, self-worth? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that I teach is to just remember to be active. And I believe that it's so easy for us as humans to kind of slide into this place where, you know, we just spend more time on the couch watching TV (laughs) or playing video games and, you know, and we forget that we were created to be active. We were created to move. And that's why, that's why one of my uh, promises to myself is that I will spend at least 45 minutes every day being active. And for me, I always do it outside. So that was one of my commitments. It will always be outside. And in Canada, of course, that means a lot of, you know, blizzards and and snow and driving rain and, and things like that. But then at the same time, sometimes beautiful, beautiful weather. And now I just love it. I look forward to it. I oftentimes do more movement and exercise than that, but it's always a minimum. So that's that's what makes a big difference for me, and that's what I teach to others. Active movement. So you spend 45 minutes almost every day. What kind of exercises do you perform in those 45 minutes? Well, one of one of the things I do is I walk. And I really believe in in being active and walking, just the simple act of walking. But I also do exercises every day that strengthen my core. And they're just very simple exercises that you can find online. And it's it's just it's just really fun to have a routine where you're you're always doing some of those things that make you feel strong and they help you to feel confident and I I just really embrace that. Plus, I love being in nature. And I always encourage everybody that I work with to make sure that they're exposing themselves to nature on a regular basis, preferably every day. When you walk in nature, do you listen to music? Or do you have fun? Or you just are unplugged? 
all of those things. Sometimes I'm completely <laughs> unplugged and I love that. Other times I listen to podcasts. Sometimes I listen to music. But I just love just unplugging and just walking and just enjoying it and doing deep breathing. Deep breathing is incredibly valuable. And it's something that a lot of us overlook, I think. Just really making it a practice to do deep breathing. So I do Wim Hof deep breathing and I just love Wim Hof practices. And I love ice cold water immersion as well. So that's something that I enjoy doing too. So do you do you do deep breathing in that 45 minute exercise time or it just you can do it anytime i can do it anytime and i i always do it when i first wake up so i do it when i first wake up but then i integrate it with other things like when i'm driving or when i'm when i'm doing my 45 minute exercising or you know at different times in the day i just do deep breathing and it just makes me feel so energized and so alive what time do you wake up <laughs> I well for the last I would say 4 months at least it's been 6:45 6:45 yeah so not terribly early but that's because of the routines in our in our home because my son is with us and he's a university student so he had moved away and gone to residence but then when covid started he had to move back because residence closed and so just because of our family routines this works 6:45 works some t- some days i get up earlier but 6:45 works and then in the evenings a lot of times i do i do work as well so you know i just have a a, a routine and a and a system that works for me and and that's my wake up time there is a saying from jaco willink that discipline creates freedom yes <laughs> Yes. So what does your first 60 to 90 minutes of your morning look like? Well, I I get out of bed and I have a cold shower and then I I meditate and then I do deep breathing as well. That's part of that. And then I now it varies depending on whether my wife is home or not. My wife is a critical care worker, a frontline nurse. and so some days she's at work because she works 12 hour shifts and she works all night she usually works the night shift so when she comes home which would be about 7:45 i like to spend a little time with her if possible and just spend you know 20 minutes half an hour just really uh refreshing our relationship just just talking and and sharing uh, stories and things like that and so then i go to my office after that and get into my day's work how long have you been married well i've been married 20 years we celebrated <laughs> in november yeah 20 years and we went to montreal to celebrate and that was really exciting uh-huh. it was really fun coming back to the meditation practice so again coming back to the meditation in a way that you have a podcast mindfulness mode podcast you spread the word around mindfulness so i would love to ask you your meditation practice what do you do in that how many minutes of meditation do you do well i i meditate every morning for 20 minutes and that's a given that's just something i do and it's silent meditation i used to quite a long time ago i used to use guided meditations and i loved that and then i got to the point where i just wanted silence i just wanted that silent meditation and i i just absolutely love it and look forward to it and there are lots of days when i do extra meditation just depending on how i feel and how my day is going and i'll just you know just set aside some extra time and do some extra meditation if i want to and it just it just refreshes me and makes me feel more centered and more grounded so yeah that's my meditation practice what kind of meditation do you advise to somebody who is a beginner well what i advise is just keep it simple and don't be judgmental on yourself don't say to yourself after two or three times oh i can't do this oh you know this is not working for me so in other words just try like one minute just try something so basic one minute 
and that that can be enough and it doesn't matter if your mind is going all over the place it doesn't matter if it feels really awkward that's okay just notice what it feels like to just set aside one minute where you're not doing anything you're not going anywhere you're not trying to achieve something you're just simply taking a moment as a gift to yourself and if you truly do that i think you'll want to give yourself two minutes and three minutes and maybe you'll want to try a guided meditation and you can get guided meditations online or on apps and they can truly help you to develop a a meditation practice that really helps to enrich your life which app which meditation app would you recommend I use Insight Timer and I just love it because well for me it's I just use it as a timer most of the time and it has it has a a bell that you can adjust which bell you want which singing bowl type bell <laughs> and you know you can you can set that and you can set it for whatever length of time you want and it just gives you that frame of whatever period of time 5 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes i just love insight timer i actually use my phone timer <laughs> yeah and that time. works yeah that works so what have you learned or i should ask you how has your life changed or transformed through meditation practice well i've become much less judgmental of myself and that was kind of a byproduct of noticing when i would be judgmental of situations or if i would be judgmental of other people because i think as humans we are that's just the human condition you know we see people or we see situations and all of a sudden in our brain it's kind of like oh why is that person doing that thing you know or, or whatever it is and then i would notice that and then i would think huh i wonder why my brain went there why was i thinking that i mean that person is just living their life trying to trying to you know survive and trying to have a happy life just like every one of us we're all just trying to move forward in our lives and and have the best life possible so why am i judging that person and then after a certain period of time then i would start to notice when i was judging myself when i was bullying myself you know and after all those years of doing the anti bullying work that i did i realized you know some of the 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 most intense bullying is what we do to ourselves we bully ourselves so i learned that you know every time i would do that every time my mind would go there i would notice it and then by noticing it later i could do something about it i could stop it in its tracks and i could i could change that's why in in the training that i offer i talk about shaking off the inner bully shake off your inner bully and i talk all about that and teach you how to shake off your inner bully because it can make your life so much better this is so powerful and interesting you just mentioned that inner bullying we we usually consider bullying from somebody else we never yes. consider that we are bullying ourselves right do you remember any instance if you don't mind speaking about that when you are bullying yourself in certain ways oh many yes oh yeah many i i there are so many <laughs> like i don't even know where to start but i mean one of the things is that i love to be with people i love to be teaching people i love to be performing music in front of people and when i was a kid i always wanted to practice my music with somebody else wa- watching or listening like so it would be like an audience you know and i would say well i don't want to practice by myself <laughs> it just didn't make any sense to me but then in my mind because i'm at my studio a lot doing my own work by myself then my mind will play tricks on me sometimes and be like like you know why are you by yourself and you know why are you not spending time with other people or in front of other people and you know from there it can get into a nasty place and then i just stop it 
in its tracks. And I, I just, I just don't even go there. Inner bullying can take in a form of inner critique, judgment toward ourselves, and beating ourselves. Yes. Is there any other practice to cope with this bullying to ourselves? Yes, yes, there are other practices that can that can help people for sure. And uh, you know, I think I think one of the things is just really making a game plan, making sure that you've made a game plan in your life. And that's one of the things I teach in my training is, is about making a game plan and how important it is. We all talk about goals. You know, we've heard all kinds of things about, you know, setting these, these goals and everything else. But a lot of times we don't do it properly. We don't set it up in such a way that it really feeds us and it really helps us to move forward. So by making a game plan, then every single day when you wake up, you have, you have something to work toward. You have something to be excited about, something to be passionate about. And that is truly important because so many people get caught up in this, this place where they've lost their excitement for life. They don't really truly know why they're living or why they're getting up every day. And that becomes discouraging and that leads to self-bullying. How do you differentiate between goal setting and a game plan? Well, a game plan includes so much more. Like goal setting is great. It's just about goals specifically, but making a game plan, I get into a lot of detail when I talk to people about how to make a game plan because it involves longer term goals, shorter term goals, daily goals. It involves habits forming positive habits and noticing the habits that you have in life and deciding, is that a positive habit or not? Is that a habit that feeds me or not? And if it's a habit that I need to move out of my life, then I'll do that and I'll do it often by replacing it with another habit that I'm really excited about. What I understand that you teach this framework in your training. If you don't mind speaking about this framework for the next five minutes, what practices or what does this framework look like? Yeah, there are, there are five specific aspects to this. I call them five pillars. And the first one, and this is, this is my uh, Stand Up Now Blueprint is what it is. And it's, <laughs> I, I even have the website standupnowblueprint.com. And you can go and, and check it out if, if you're interested. But the first thing is all about be who you're meant to be. It's kind of like, okay, you, you've got to start to get comfortable with who you are. Get comfortable with being in your own skin and understanding that you are enough, that you are the person that is here to contribute to this planet, to contribute to humanity, that you are valuable. And I talk a lot about that with my, my people. Be who you're meant to be. And the second one, then I get right into mindset, get right into that inner voice. And, and I talk about shake off your inner bully, which we've already talked about. And the third one is one that, you know, a lot of people might find this a bit unusual or a bit strange, and that is end the hustling mentality. And especially in North America, <laughs> I think there's so much about, you know, go, go, go. You got to do more. You got you to gotta achieve more. You've gotta, you got to just keep doing more. Get up earlier. Go to bed later. Just get it done. Get it done. And, and, and you know, you just have to end that kind of mindset. Yes, it's important to take action. Absolutely. Taking action is crucial. But at the same time, we can kind of drive ourselves crazy and cause huge problems with our level of contentment, huge problems with our focus and our relationship with other people. And all of those things are important. And if we're just push, push, pushing all the time, trying to move toward a certain goal and you're doing it, with the exclusion of your relationships, your health, your, your inner bully, then you're not going to, I don't believe, you're not going to feel good about your life. 
I can definitely relate to inner bullying because I struggled with that in the past and I've been able to work overcome that part to a great extent in my life. So I definitely understand how this inner bullying really stops us to move forward with calm, happiness and everything, you know, in life. Yes, it really makes a huge difference, doesn't it, Nishan? It does, it does. And mindset mindfulness meditation they are are great people have those goals and still some people are not able to achieve those goals people are hustling through in their life and i think sometimes social media can contribute towards hustling and i get into that zone at times that hustling 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 go 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 all the time but i remind myself with this powerful quote I don't remember where I heard this quote from, but what it matters at the end, there is nothing that matters at the end. Everything turns to dust at the yes. end of life. Yes. So we got to take action. We got to achieve our goals, have those action items, do all those things. But what it matters at the end, you know, like having a game plan. That's what you mentioned earlier. That matters. Yes, yes. And, and the last one is being willing to ask for help. And so I talk about it in the terms of mentoring. And sometimes we have to invest in mentoring. Sometimes we can, we can get mentoring and it's, it's completely free. It's not something that we have to make an actual investment in. But if it's free, it's still an investment. So in other words, if you are uh, dedicated to learning from well, let's for, say, for instance, Brian Tracy is one of my mentors. And so I've read many, many of his books. I've watched his videos. And I, I truly invested in him just simply by devoting that time to reading his books and doing the exercises that he teaches and watching his videos. So for a long time, I didn't invest any money in having Brian Tracy as my mentor. But then later, I... I did because an amazing thing happened, and that is that I was doing my anti-bullying work and going to hundreds and hundreds of schools, and one day I received an, an email from the Brian Tracy team, and they had, they had seen some of my work online with the, the bullying, anti-bullying work I did, and they were putting together a book because Brian Tracy has written many books and they wanted to invite me to be part of this project because they were looking for people who had worked in mainstream jobs, in my case, teaching and had transitioned into being entrepreneurs. And they wanted to have that person talk about their journey and how they had moved forward and transitioned their life to become an entrepreneur. And so I, at first I, I thought, <laughs> is this even real? <laughs> like, what is this? You know? And, and so anyway, I ended up meeting Brian Tracy and being part of the book. And it was just so exciting to, to be. And so I was able to, in a way, invest more of my life into, uh, you know, having this mentor, this wonderful mentor of Brian Tracy. And it was really exciting. Brian Tracy is powerful. I follow him as well. What, Do you? Yeah. What did you learn from him personally or what exercises have you learned from him that you apply in your life? Well, one of the things I learned from him is just about being calm and taking things step by step. Because when he does a, a talk or a speech or a video or even an audio, he always has a, a calmness about him. And he's, he doesn't teach a lot about meditation or about mindfulness. Mindfulness wasn't really a word that people talked about back when he was creating a lot of his work, but he exhibited that. He acted that. He lived it. He showed us that there was a certain calmness that you could achieve. And he said, you know what? You can learn to do anything you decide to. You can learn that. And he said, a lot of people think, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. But that's mindset. That's just you thinking you can't do something. If you truly want to do something, you can learn how to do it. So those are some of the things that Brian taught me. 
And doing something new initially takes time. It takes courage because we mess up. We don't know that thing. You know, when I started this podcast, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So <laughs> Me too, time, when I started mine too. <laughs> when we keep doing certain things over and over, we get confidence and we try to improvise with time and our skill gets better and better. So that yes. requires courage initially and calmness, as you said, we get to be calm and patient with ourselves. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, how do you recommend or what would you recommend to somebody to be calm? Because calmness is not common these days. People are can be impatient at times. I, I can be impatient at times as oh, well. Oh, sure. Sure. We can all be impatient at times. But I think the biggest thing that contributes to calmness is meditation. And just do it. You don't have to say to yourself, oh, I want to be calm. I want to be calm. I'm trying to be calm. I need to be calm because, you know, that just doesn't really work. But if you just simply meditate and make that a practice in your life, the calmness will just come. And the same thing with immersing yourself in nature, then the calmness will come from the nature. So doing some of these practices we've already talked about, really will help you to have calmness in your life. And it's not something you have to really work specifically on calmness. You do the other things and the calmness naturally follows. It's a byproduct. <laughs> yes, it is. You have so many guests on your podcast related to mindfulness and in this space. Is there any practice that you learned from your guest? And, and before that, you were not aware of those practices? Well, yeah, definitely. One of them was Wim Hof that I spoke of earlier, W-I-M-H-O-F. And I hadn't heard of Wim Hof at all when I started my podcast. And then, you know, I would interview different people and it would just pop up. You know, somebody would say, oh, yeah, by the way, I do Wim Hof. And I thought, what's that? You know, I didn't know anything about it. And then I, I searched, I asked people, some of the people that really really connected with Wim Hof told me more. And one woman I interviewed, she even invited Wim Hof to stay over at her house when he was in her city doing some, some talks. And so she got to know him personally. And she told me a story about Wim Hof and how, you know, she just had this little tiny house that was just very, very small and humble. And he was just completely happy to be in her house and the bed that she had for him I think she said that one of the legs was broken and she had to prop it up on some books or something like that and so she said she felt kind of embarrassed because her home was so tiny and so humble but he was completely grateful and appreciative and he didn't care at all and so they became good friends and so Wim Hof has really taught me a lot even though I haven't met him personally and that is that you can gain a lot of strength and power and inner confidence and power by doing some of the Wim Hof practices and one of them is is ice cold showers and ice cold immersion you know, like just being willing to do that every single day and understanding that sometimes you know doing something like that can teach us things that we never dreamt it could teach us so doing Wim Hof practices and the Wim Hof breathing has been incredible for me what's what's your guest name if you don't mind speaking about that oh geez i i thought is he gonna ask me my guest name because i don't <laughs> remember oh i think it was edith ubuntu Ch uh Cho choi edith i'm pretty sure it was edith so if you go to mindfulnessmode.com i have a search bar at the top and if you type in edith then that episode will pop right up so it's mindfulnessmode.com, yes, and and Edith. I'm sure that's who it was. I'm pretty sure, but I have interviewed a lot of people. E D I T H. Yeah, if you're not sure, maybe you can send it to me later on, and we'll put yeah. it into the show notes. Wim yeah, I'm pretty sure edit. that's it. Yeah. Is there any life philosophy, or do you have any life philosophy you live your life with? Anything yeah, that definitely. Comes to your mind. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, one of my life philosophies is about gratitude. And I think this makes a huge difference in your life to live every moment with genuine gratitude. 
And I think that word genuine is very important because, you know, there are all kinds of gratitude journals and all <laughs> kinds of chats about gratitude. And we can go on, we can go on podcasts about gratitude. We can read books about gratitude. You know, you don't need to read a book about gratitude. Go ahead if you want to, and you'll probably enjoy it. But the thing is, genuine gratitude just means take a moment and think about something that truly feeds you. You're truly grateful for it. It just You just feel it vibrating in your body. You feel it in your bones. You're so grateful for that thing. And just think about it and let it resonate with you. And realize that by doing that and living in the moment, it's going to give you contentment. It's going to give you it's going to give you a degree of happiness that you could not have found. And so many of us think, oh, if I just had more money, if I just had a new car, oh, if I could just move to a new house on the, on the beach or something, all of those things are great. And there's nothing the, the matter with wanting to you know, get a new car or something, but we can have gratitude and have happiness and contentment in the most humble place without all those things. Genuine gratitude. What are you genuinely grateful for today? <laughs> I am so genuinely grateful for my son. He is such a gift to me. And my wife and I never thought we were going to have children. And so, you know, I was almost 40 and so was she. And we both thought, you know, we're never going to have children. We didn't think we were going to have children. And then all of a sudden, surprise. <laughs> and so our son was born and he's just been the most beautiful gift anyone could ever receive. And, you know, sometimes people would say, oh, wait till he's two. Oh, then, you know, then life will be a challenge. Oh, wait till he's a teenager then. But you know what? Every single day with him has been a pleasure and a challenge. Well, when I say that a pleasure, and then I meant to say it's been a pleasure. Yes, some days have been challenges. It's not like I'm trying to pretend it's all easy or anything like that. But every day has just been something I've looked forward to and watching him grow, watching him learn, the excitement, the passion. When he was a little boy, he said, Dad, I want to invent a time machine. And I thought, oh, <laughs> wow, that's, that's a pretty big, you know, undertaking. But he was a little boy, you know, he's about six or seven. And I want to be a scientist. And I want to invent a, a time machine. And, you know, one day he said, I want to have conveyor belts going all over the house. And then I would just put things on the conveyor belts. And then I would watch them and, you know, things like that. Well, skip ahead to now. He was so dedicated to wanting to become a scientist that he just kept thinking about it and reading about it and learning about it. And then when he was uh, in his final uh, years of high school, he said, Dad, I want to be a theoretical physicist. I want to be a physicist. And I'm like, wow, that's exciting. And so he applied to the top schools and he got in. At all three of them, he got in at his first choice. It's Waterloo University here in Canada, and it's an absolute top university for scientists and tech people. And he was just so excited to go there and to learn about physics and math and all of these things. And now he's doing it from home, but he's still just as excited. So I am totally grateful and genuinely grateful for my son, Ben. What makes a successful child? <laughs> you know what I think what makes a successful child is accepting them the way they are and encouraging them and helping them grow and just supporting them in every possible way that you can. And if you practice mindfulness and you truly and genuinely want to bring your child up with love and caring, then you will have an element of calm to you. And 
you know, because there, there are moments, you know, when we feel like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm going to lose it. You know, this, this child is driving me crazy. Well, <laughs> you know what? Mindfulness will help you so that that won't happen. Yes, feel your emotions. Yes, you, you need to be expressive. Yes, we need to teach our children what to do and what not to do. But exploding at our child or being irrational with our child is not what, we, what, what can help our child grow into being a positive, happy human being. That's how I believe. You know, <laughs> like in, in, encourage your child through calmness and strength and confidence and genuine gratitude. I'm just going to make this up that mindfulness is kind of a wall between a human being and escapism. There is nowhere to escape. <laughs> yes, that's so true. Yeah, nowhere to escape. Awesome, Bruce. It's been a wonderful conversation. And before I ask you my last question, I want to ask you that what books have inspired you the most in your life? Well, one of the books that has really inspired me. I'm just reaching over here because it's right here, usually right beside me, but it's called Wherever You Go, There You Are. And it's uh, by John Kabat-Zinn, Mindfulness Meditation in Everyday Life. And my book is well-worn and you can open this book to any page and you just read a little bit on that page and you're like, wow. Wow, how insightful, how incredible, how much that feeds me. Those words feed me. And it's a, it's a beautiful book. I mean, there are, there are thousands and thousands of beautiful books about mindfulness. But this is one that I have beside me that's well-worn and I truly value it. This is interesting that a lot of my podcast guests have recommended this book. <laughs> Right. Every, yes. Almost every one of them have recommended that. Yeah, book. it's a great book. Awesome. And uh, do you have any suggestion, closing thought, recommendation, anything that you want to suggest or tell to our listeners? Yes, absolutely. You know what? Believe. Just think of that word, that word that starts with B. Believe. Believe in yourself. Believe that you are here for a purpose. Believe that you are enough. Believe that every single day you can improve, you can achieve, you can, you can just enjoy the moment. And you don't have to be pushing, 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 pushing and having that hustling mentality, you know, and, and like I said earlier, you can go to standupnowblueprint.com and check out my, my free training right there. And, and I, I really, really encourage you to believe in yourself and that will bring inner confidence and strength and then you'll you'll have a game plan and you'll move forward and feel excited about your life and and so many of these things we've talked about today you know so many of these things nishant will really help you to have a better life and to live in the moment and feel truly contented and happy believe really really works and as you, as you just mentioned believe one book that comes to my mind is The Magic of Thinking Big. Very powerful ah. old book. And there is one chapter on creativity. I read that chapter over and over. And every time my output, my efficiency and effectiveness gets better and better. The how to think big, there is a magic in thinking big. Yes, I agree with you. And in that entire book, the author speaks about believe. If you don't believe nobody's gonna believe in you just believe just keep believing and take keep taking action beautiful beautiful and i'm glad you said that because i have not read that book and i will i will get that book and read it because i love reading and i, I thank you for that recommendation sure and that book is so simple but sometimes the wisdom lies in the simplicity <laughs> So simple book and just keep reading the same thing over and over. It creates new connections in our brain. That's how yes, I it see. does. I agree with you, Nishan. Well, thank you so much, 
Bruce. It was wonderful, mindful conversation. I really enjoyed every moment. And thank you, Nishan. And I'm honored to be on your show. And I just want to say to your listeners, you know, I'm so appreciative of what you do in the world and how you've, you've put together this podcast. And like you said, at first, you weren't sure quite what you were doing, but you just pushed ahead and you did it. And you've really changed a lot of people's lives for the better, just by getting your voice out there and being willing to just kind of step out and push yourself and, and do what you did. And I really appreciated when you reached out to me and, and sent me your email. And I'm like, wow, this is a real person. This isn't a template. This isn't something that you, you know, somebody told you, oh, write this sentence and write that sentence and word it like this and fill in the blanks <laughs> and all this stuff. It was you, you genuinely reaching out to me. And I'm so grateful for that. For, so thank you so much for having me on your show, Nishant. Thank you so much, Bruce. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much again. Bye. Take care. Bye now. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or you can visit https colon slash slash nishangarg.me n-i-s-h-a-n-t-g-a-r-g dot me you can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life you are not alone in this journey we all struggle in life there is no shame in talking about it i go through my highs and lows i get depressed and these practices help me in living a resilient life you can also do this you got this don't judge yourself you are doing the best you can and thank you so much again